how does this microphone work? Yeah, have you enjoyed my microphone testing? Okay, welcome everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. We're going to do things slightly differently than in the rest of the series. Um, we're going to have a uh, um, 15 minute talk roughly from our guest speaker and then he will be interviewed by Mark Deveni. For those of you who don't know Mark, Mark is the academic program leader of the humanities program here, um, political theorist. Um, that's all I'm going to say about Mark. <laughs> <laughs> you probably know. Um, our guest is Sir David Eastwood. He is currently the Vice Chancellor at the University of Birmingham. He was part author of the Brown Report, Brown Review or Report. Um, he was the head of Hefke and he was also, were you the head of the AHRC as well? Well, it was AHRE, actually, yes. Okay. Um, and his academic background is he was a historian of modern Britain. So, a long time he was at Oxford. He was also Vice Chancellor at East Anglia. Um, so, an incredibly illustrious academic career. Uh, we're very honoured to have him here to talk to us, to share his views on university education and what it is and should be. So, uh, thank you, and let's welcome our speaker. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to see so many uh, people here, and thank you uh, for the invitation. I know that uh, some of you in uh, the room are studying philosophy, and you might like to ask you a question. How is it possible to pose an invitation to which the only answer can be yes? Um, and that's exactly what your colleagues did when they invited me. They said, we'd, we'd love you to come and speak in this series. We're giving you, uh, I think it was 15 months notice, um, and you can come on more or less any day of your choosing. So, if philosophically you want to ask a question which must invoke the answer, yes, that's the way uh, to do it. Um, it's a great pleasure, too, to be speaking in the uh, David Watson Memorial Lectures series. Um, David and I uh, were great friends uh, over... Uh, a number of years, and uh, David and I had a number of things in common, perhaps the most important uh, was a passion for higher education. Uh, David and I didn't always agree, um, but when we disagreed, we disagreed well, and actually one of the things that I think is, is important in debates, and particularly debates about universities, is disagreeing well. Um, thinking about David, it just reminded me of a story, this was actually when I was Vice-Chancellor of, of East Anglia, and David was in, in, in Norwich and he'd given a talk at the cathedral as it happens. Um, and the following day, uh, there was the University of UK Media Conference in Manchester. So uh, David and I uh, shared the car uh, driving to Manchester. And most of the time we were talking about higher education, higher education policy issues. And when we got close to Manchester, I said, David, we'd have to talk about the really important issue, which is given that how Newby, who was then Chief Executive of he was going to do a keynote. Which vice chancellors would ask questions and in which order? Because this was highly predictable. So we went through and we had a kind of sweepstake. And we, did, we named between us the first seven vice chancellors who would ask questions. And in the, in the audience, David and I weren't sitting uh, next to one another, but we were ticking them off. And the first six we got right, we were both really annoyed actually um, that we didn't get the seventh right. So David had a, had a great sense of humour and a great sense of fun. Um, and sadly, uh, David, as some of you who, who knew David will know, David was a, a really very, very fine pianist. Um, I was a violinist, but not as accomplished as David. And we always promised that we would play the Brahms violin sonatas together. Um, and sadly, that never happened. So as I say, it's, uh, it's, it's poignant, but it's, it's a great pleasure to be speaking in this series in David's memory. What I, what I want to do is to spend a, a few minutes giving an answer to the examination question, what should universities be? And then we're going to move to, to a conversation. And I was keen to have the conversation um, because uh, I'm, I'm keen to hear what, what you have to say and I'm keen to have a, a wide-ranging discussion uh, and debate. So I hope that what I'm about to say isn't going to constrain uh, the conversation uh, around the room uh, this evening. 
What I'm going to say is schematic, because I'm only going to speak briefly, but I hope it's not polemical. My short answer to the question, what should universities be, is universities should be what they have always been. They should be places of exploration, places of discovery, places of contestation, and places of education. And if you think about the great universities over uh, now the better part of three millennia, it seems to me that they have always been characterised uh, by uh, those features by a kind of structural curiosity which takes place uh, in universities and, and has, I think, uh, a unique context and a unique power when exploration is taking place within a university environment. They must be places of discovery, they must be places of unquiet souls, they must be places uh, where people are uneasy about common uh, and uh, received understanding. They must be places of debate, places of contestation, places which are animated by, by ideas and by uh, the collision uh, of those uh, ideas. And they must also have at their heart uh, education, because if universities cease to educate, if they cease uh, to hold education as being something uh, which is precious and which is fundamental, they become something which is very different. So for me, the university of the future must be that university which explores, which discovers, which contests, and which educates. And universities seem to me still to be places where knowledge is ordered. Of course they're places where knowledge is discovered, uh, is discovered uh, they're places of research, they're places of debate. Um, but one of the unique achievements of universities over the centuries has been the way in which they have ordered knowledge. Um, and that's what makes them places which are precious and that's what makes them places of understanding. Um, and in, in a world where information is ever more easily acquired, that challenge, that challenge uh, to the ordering of knowledge seems to me to be a challenge probably of an ever higher order. Universities should be places, too, where understanding, where learning is assessed and is credentialed. That, too, I think, has been part of the historic role of universities, to find ways, not just of exploring ideas, not just of developing understanding uh, with uh, the student body, uh, but of taking the responsibility of assessing that uh, understanding. Um, and so assessment and what our American friends would call credentialing uh, has and I think will always be characteristic of part of the wider responsibility uh, of uh, universities. And there must be places which are engaged with and not remote from <coughs> the societies that support them. That's not always comfortable for universities and it's not always comfortable for the societies in which we uh, operate. Um, but universities are not separate from society, they're not apart from uh, society. Uh, they are part of the fundamental uh, fabric uh, of society. They bring challenge, they bring understanding, uh, they drive uh, knowledge through uh, research. Um, but that wider public role of universities, that wider social role of universities, is something that from time to time we have lost and from time to time uh, we have uh, undervalued. Uh, and it's important therefore in universities that um, we speak appropriate languages to one another and some of those languages that we use within universities uh, are complex languages. Um, but also it's important that we have language which, is, which enable us to engage, to engage with a wider public. Um, and the universities um, which set themselves apart are, I think, universities which are defaulting on something which is critical to universities' mission. Mm. Now, I think all of that endures, it endures in different ways, and I don't think that that is going uh, to be corroded um, by the rise of other media of communication. It's interesting, uh, over my career, how often uh, the role of universities uh, is going to be displaced or decentered by the rise of the rise of the 
uh, internet, the rise of the digital, the rise of the MOOC, uh, the rise of what we rather vulgarly now call alternative modes of delivery. Um, now, it, it seems to me, as it were, as, 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 the, as the sun sets or as the out of Minerva takes flight, what we've seen with all of those new technologies, new technologies of communication, new supports to uh, learning, um, is what we saw with the great printing uh, revolution um, uh, of the late Renaissance and early Reformation. Um, that actually those sorts of new technologies of learning, of exploration, and of communication are actually harnessed in and by universities. They don't subvert, they actually complement uh, what we do. So anybody who talks about the death of the university, anybody who talks about the displacement of the university, I think is not attending to the history of universities uh, and is actually um, not attending to those things which are fundamental to uh, defining and animating universities. Now, if you share the vision of universities that I have been sketching so far, um, it seems to me that there are four prerequisites of, of universities being those places of uh, exploration, discovery, contestation and education. And they are that universities must be autonomous, they must be broadly based, they must be sustainable and they must be accountable. Let me say a little about uh, each of those uh, pillars. Universities must be uh, autonomous. Now autonomy will always have limits and I think it's important that we accept those, uh, those limits but we will want to explore them. But fundamentally uh, great universities and great university systems are characterised by autonomy. What do I mean by autonomy? Uh, I mean that universities should admit the students that they choose to admit that they should prescribe curricula in the way they choose to prescribe those curricula. They should assess student learning in ways of their choosing. They should appoint the staff that they choose to appoint. And they should be free to explore the research they think that matters. Now, where that kind of autonomy starts to be attenuated, where that kind of autonomy starts to come uh, under challenge, uh, it does seem to me that it's a challenge, as it were, to, to the fundamentals of what a university is. Um, and that challenge is a challenge which has come uh, through the ages. It, it's a challenge that many uh, of our colleagues in other university systems uh, face. Um, and it's something that actually makes governments uncomfortable. Uh, I've spent much of my uh, later uh, career working um, with government working alongside our government. And one of the things that government finds really difficult, actually, about the British University system is that it's, it's successful. And most of our public discourses are discourses uh, about the failure of the public sector. Um, but it also finds the autonomy of universities really difficult. Um, because they are, they are not institutions that can be commanded, they're not institutions that can be controlled. Um, and if you want a currently worked example of how difficult uh, governments find university autonomy, just attend to what is going on in Scotland uh, at the moment uh, with the Higher Education Bill in the Scottish Parliament. So autonomy is one of my four uh, fundamental pillars of what universities should be. The second uh, fundamental pillar is that universities should be broadly based. Subject breadth matters. That community of learning is essential. So I, I would actually want to argue that the true university is a broadly comprehensive university. Now that gets us into some difficult areas, and, and I recognise here that that is a spectrum. But I would want to argue that the monotechnic is not a university. It's not an argument about better or worse. Um, it's an argument about the characteristics of institutions which should call themselves uh, universities. It's also, I think, uh, important um, that universities uh, embrace uh, the diversity of learning, the diversity of understanding and the diversity of uh, exploration. And for that reason, science, engineering, uh, medicine seems to me to be critically important to defining what that kind of taxonomy of knowledge is which underpins a university. And it is very interesting 
uh, that a lot of the debate about what a university is, a lot of the debate about the failure of, uh, or the alleged failure of universities uh, in this country is not a debate about science, uh, engineering uh, or medicine. So I think it is important when we're thinking about the university, when we're thinking about the challenges to the university, we think about universities as being broadly based, as being broadly comprehensive institutions. Um, and it seems to me that a liberal arts college, therefore, is something which is different from a university. It's, it is in no sense inferior to a university, and actually some of the best education in the world is delivered uh, by liberal arts uh, colleges. Um, but I would want to make a, a claim um, about the importance of breadth to a university and to a university community. My third pillar is that universities must be uh, sustainable. Fundamentally, I, I mean by that that they should be academically uh, sustainable, that they should have within, within them um, that kind of uh, academic energy which animates and sustains uh, a, a university. Um, I also think, and this I know is a rather conservative view, I think universities are places. Uh, I think the relationship between the university and place is important. It's one of the reasons why I think new technologies of learning and communication don't uh, actually displace or decenter uh, the university, because place uh, matters. And of course universities should be financially sustainable, and therein lies a challenge, and it's a challenge I'll come back to uh, right at the end. But if a university is not sustainable, um, then a university ultimately doesn't have a future, and if a university doesn't have a future, uh, then the university is not serving its students, it's not serving uh, its faculty, and of course it's not serving the community of which it is a part. And my fourth pillar is accountability. And actually, I do think there is a very interesting counterpoint uh, between autonomy and uh, accountability. Universities must be accountable uh, to the societies that fund them. Accountability doesn't mean conformity, uh, but it does mean a responsibility to give account uh, to what you are and what you're doing in return for the public investment that you as universities receive. Universities should be accountable to those who study in them, those who work in them, those who are dependent uh, upon them. And those forms of accountability are, are complex, uh, but they are critically uh, important. Thirdly, I think universities have uh, an accountability to publish and to report what they do, by which I mean uh, that the research uh, that is undertaken uh, in universities, of course, is and should be com communicated to those research communities, but that uh, research should also be uh, communicated in appropriate ways to a wider public, so that the public has an appreciation of what it is that universities do. And underpinning all of that, what I'm really saying about accountability is that we must recognise that a public university has public accountability. So I think if you, if you share the kind of vision of universities that I uh, tried to outline in the opening of my remarks, then being autonomous, being broadly based, being sustainable and being accountable uh, are four of the key pillars. There are probably others, um, uh, but uh, time uh, moves on. <coughs> The third thing I think is critically uh, important uh, to uh, universities as they should be is that they should be authentically led. You'd expect me to say something about uh, leadership in universities, and I will. I think universities being authentically led means that they should be academically led. Um, and earlier this morning I was talking to um, uh, a group of my colleagues uh, at Birmingham who were on a, a leadership programme uh, in the university and that was the first and most important point I made that I think universities uh, should be academically led, they should be led by people who have academic credibility, they should be led uh, by uh, those um, who uh, have a, um, a fundamental sympathy uh, for uh, the, the core activities of universities, university research, university uh, education uh, and the way in which universities serve their, their community. 
I think universities should be well led, and I think those of us who lead universities have a responsibility to lead well. And we might want to come back to that and what that means. I think authentic leadership and authentic dialogues in universities uh, means that universities have to be able to change. The disciplinary landscape changes, the nature of inquiry and understanding uh, changes. And it seems to me that it is important uh, that universities should not be straitjacketed into a 19th century uh, taxonomy uh, of knowledge. Change in university isn't, isn't easy, and uh, in some ways universities are fundamentally conservative institutions, and that conservatism gives them their resilience. Um, but nevertheless, the ability to change, the ability to adapt, um, uh, the ability to remould the, the university is, I think, critically important. And I also think universities should be led uh, with uh, integrity. Um, and um, one of the things that struck me when I was leading the Higher Education Funding Council and saw some of the things that went wrong and sometimes went badly wrong uh, in universities, uh, there were usually a number of failures. Um, uh, but one of the failures was, was an absence of integrity and authenticity in the way in which those institutions were led uh, and uh, governed. So authenticity um, in leadership is critical, integrity in leadership is critical, and, and a leadership which is academically sympathetic seems to me to be uh, axiomatic. So if you're with me so far, or broadly with me uh, so far, um, then what is it uh, that challenges this vision of what a university should be, um, and why is the idea of a university so frequently contested? The first, I think, is because of the social purposes and political salience of universities. Um, those within universities uh, will, will want to debate their wider purposes. Those who fund universities uh, will uh, want to contest the purposes of universities. Um, uh, and as universities become, uh, um, uh, well, as, as universities become part of a system of mass higher education, that's not something, it's not a debate uh, that we can avoid or evade, nor is it a debate that we should avoid uh, or uh, evade. The period that universities have been going through, really from the 1960s through to the present day, um, is usually described as a transition uh, from elite to mass higher education. That's how David Watson uh, always uh, described uh, that uh, transition. From a period, you know, in, in this country, um, in the early 60s, uh, where between 7 and 8% uh, of the 18-19 year old population uh, attended higher education through to now uh, where the figure uh, is in the mid 40s. I mean that by any analysis is a, is a massive transformation uh, of what higher education is and it's a massive transformation of what universities are and what they are for. So as I say that the, the, the characteristic um, description of that transition is from elite to mass higher education. Um, I think there is a more provocative way of thinking about that, uh, which is the transition uh, from an aristocratic to a democratic idea of a university. Um, and quite a lot of the debate about what a university should be um, is, is a debate uh, which is, is retrospective, is in some sense nostalgic, and is looking back to what I would describe as an aristocratic idea of the university. The university uh, for the few and uh, not the many, higher education for the few, not the many, higher education funded by the many for the few, uh, rather than funded for the many. And I think it's that transition from aristocratic to democratic notions of, of, of what a university is that has created quite a lot of the tensions um, and quite a lot uh, of the current debate about what a university is and what it should be. Um, <coughs> These tensions, I think, are also manifest now in the way in which I think the legitimate accountabilities of university is being pushed too far. There is too much regulatory intrusion. 
Um, uh, government, uh, because it, it is and remains the principal funder of universities, has a disposition uh, to intervene. And because we operate in a mass system of higher education, uh, government believes uh, that higher education uh, and therefore universities are critically important instruments uh, of public uh, policy. Um, and um, I think in some ways the most you know, baleful uh, manifestation uh, of this uh, transition um, is the way in which students uh, have been recast uh, as customers. Um, I'm sure it's not different at the University of Brighton. I don't have any students at the University of Birmingham who describe themselves as customers. Uh, the students at the University of Birmingham, uh, as I'm sure it's true, the students at the University of Brighton describe themselves as students. That's the status um, uh, that students aspire to having uh, within uh, universities. It's a status which is about learning and about exploration. Um, and, and, and therefore, it seems to me that that, that attempt um, by those outside universities to recast uh, uh, the student as something other than the student, as, as, uh, as customer, as consumer, misses something which is fundamentally important both to the student's experience and to the nature uh, of a university. And that's not to say that students don't expect good value, and it's not it, to, accept, uh, to suggest that students don't consume uh, in, in certain rather important ways. Um, but when we, when we, know, when we lose uh, the notion <coughs> that to study in a university is to be a student, it seems to me we lose something which is axiomatic uh, to define what a university is. The other, and perhaps, Overarching reason um, why uh, what a university should be is, is so vigorously contested um, is in that transition from um, aristocratic to democratic or elite to mass higher education. Uh, there has been a struggle uh, to find what um, I call the new political economy of higher education. Um, uh, and the search for a new political economy by which I mean a way of funding higher education which is equitable and sustainable um, and enables us to sustain a mass system of higher education has been uh, the great and debated quest uh, of the last uh, 30 years. Um, and there have been a number of attempts to do that. Um, there have been a number of attempts to establish a new political economy of higher education which is sustainable. Um, uh, I don't think we have yet achieved uh, the um, final goal. So, it follows, I think, from what I've been saying, um, that my view of what a university should be um, is in one sense quite a conservative view. Um, it, it's a view of, of a university um, which has thrived and been refined uh, over centuries. It's a view of a university uh, in as, as, as a community uh, of people. It's a university, it's a view of a university as something which has an important sense uh, of place. Um, uh, but it's also, I think, a, a view of a university which is profoundly uh, resilient. So when I look to the future of, of universities, when I look to the future of universities in this country, um, of course you know, I see the challenges, of course I see the issues which we are continuing to debate. Um, and, and of course, uh, I recognise that um, at least for the next few years, the funding position of universities in this country will be more challenging than it has been uh, in the past. So I don't for one moment uh, want to suggest uh, that we are uh, simply moving to sunny uplands. But I do want uh, to, to leave you with my strong sense that universities are resilient, um, uh, that universities are critically uh, important um, and uh, that universities can themselves, working with those um, who fund uh, us and those who have responsibility uh, for universities, will create an environment in which universities can flourish. And if I go back to what um, some of us in university leadership do, is we recognise that there is a necessary Faustian bargain. Um, much of the responsibility of sector leaders has been uh, to find ways in changing environments to secure the funding which is necessary to underpin universities as autonomous institutions of exploration, discovery, 
contestation and education. There is a sense in which it's a Faustian bargain. Uh, there may be occasions where uh, we have got that wrong. Um, but I, shouldn't, I, I would not want you to think uh, that where we have erred, uh, we have erred because we don't hold precious the idea of what a university has been, is, and will continue to be. Thank you. Um, if you look at our colleagues in local government, 
uh, they are now in a position where they, they can only fund statutory services. Um, and it's not fanciful to say um, that um, higher education was, as it were, in the bucket uh, with those other areas of public spending. So, Brown took a view that we had to find another way uh, of sustaining uh, investment in higher education and the mechanism that we came up with um, uh, of uh, income contingent loans or loans with income contingent payments uh, was a way in which we could do that. And actually, uh, as a result of that, um, uh, the funding for universities or the funding for, funding for university and graduate education went up in 2012 rather than down. Um, so, that was the judgment we made. It may or may not have been the right judgment, but the reason for that judgment um, was to uh, sustain uh, a high quality higher education system and to sustain investment uh, in higher education in a period where otherwise it would be cut. But the context for that as well is a European system in which uh, Britain is wholly unique. Um, there are, in no other European country, do we have fees at that level, or income contingent fees as you described us? And no other country, um, um, more or less, I think 13 countries in Europe, students don't pay fees. Um, the Brown Review does not put on the table the possibility of, for example, modelling the fees regime um, on the Swedish model or on the, German, the current German model. Germany did go through a phase of fees, as you know. In Greece, students don't pay fees. In Ireland, students don't pay fees. In Spain, they pay far lower fees than they do here. The Czech Republic, they don't pay fees. Slovenia, they don't pay fees. I, mean, do you, I, I understand the, the, that context of austerity, but it does strike me this was about political choices, not simply about austerity, that other choices could have been made. Um, and what, 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 what I was confused about in Brown was the lack of alternatives. The, the apparent lack of consideration of a range of other possible ways of funding the future of higher education. And, and, and one, sorry, one last thing. Also, the, the possibility being considered that actually the cost in the long term may be more, not less, which you, you will have seen a number of reports have suggested. Um, and it obviously depends upon all sorts of factors. But there is a possibility that the long term cost will be more to the public uh, than, than, than less. The long-term cost of what government legislated might have been more. Um, the long-term cost of Brown would not have been would, would not have been more. So your view is that you would separate those two completely. You don't think that Brown would in place what would make possible what the government did? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, no, I don't. I, mean, I think that um, what Brown was trying to do was actually to avoid some of the things that the, 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 the government did. The, uh, a tax because. It, We've gone from cap fee. If you think about it, we've gone from the the hundred thousand pounds uh, to the three thousand pounds. So, so the government did actually live to it, which was to raise the cap. Um, uh, and he thought he had a twin cap of six and nine, but of course we all know that um, that he couldn't hold that. So the institutional price three hundred thousand pound cap. Um, uh, but um, what we what we were trying to do um, was to create. Uh, a system where actually the university is also at the risk of charging a fee of £6,000. So actually what government legislated for was something that was true, you could charge £9,000 without, without any risk. Um, so um, so, so I, I would say that, that in, in a fundamental sense what Brown was uh, and what government legislated for two different things. Um, I mean, your earlier point, which is a, which is a perfectly reasonable one, um, which was why didn't we put forward a range of options? Um, we didn't put forward a range of options because we were asked to put forward a recommendation, and so that was our considered recommendation. Um, uh, it was a recommendation which was made as the, against the English context because we were, we were reporting for England. Um, and it, it is interesting if you look that um, you know, if you look what's happening to the University of Copenhagen, what's happening to Swedish universities, if you look what's quite happening to Finnish universities. They're, they are facing major funding challenges uh, now. Um, uh, so I, I think that the, the system of, of funding, um, uh, which uh, has characterised a number of European jurisdictions, 
will come under the kind of strain that happened in the UK earlier for a variety of reasons. Um, and um, I think we should be clear um, that when we're talking about free higher education, free means somebody else pays. Um, uh, and what Brown was what, what Brown was seeking to do was to, to recognise that that there, there is a benefit um, to, to to graduates. Um, uh, so the graduates uh, earn more, live better, are healthier, live longer. So there, 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 there are individual benefits that flow uh, to graduates. And they don't flow evenly, but they do flow to graduates as against non-graduates. And so to have a system of funding uh, for universities which doesn't recognise that is a system that uh, some of us would argue um, from the progressive side of the spectrum um, is inactive. Um, so what Brown was seeking to do was to balance, was to balance um, the, the social advantage of the higher education, which includes the individual, uh, to uh, the collective advantage, which, which flows to society uh, more generally. Uh, and Brown envisaged a very substantial public contribution to the cost of higher education continuing. I mean, just do one last thing about Brown. The language of Brown, if you read, going back those five years, are there not elements of that that you personally find objectionable. And things like self-investment, um, which suggests that this is a, a form of um, consumer investment in the future. You know, almost, almost as if one's investing in the stock exchange. Or, um, is, there, is, there, is there a lot of language that's at odds with your vision of what education was? Um, You could either have a centrist view of, of, of language or an instrumentalist view of language. Um, and that's the place about philosophy of language. Well, we could. We, 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 may, we may be there for the evening. Um, uh, uh, but um, if, if, uh, no, I, I will perfectly accept that there will be many in, in, in the room um, uh, who would themselves be queasy about. Um, some of the compromises people like me make um, uh, in order to try to uh, secure the results of the higher education system. Um, there, there are times when you, when you have to use the, the language that will work. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I, I've gone into the Treasury many times and come out with more money for higher education than was on the table when I went here. Um, and uh, you. Um, you use the language which is necessary, you use the views, um, <coughs> the instruments which are necessary to achieve uh, an outcome which you believe is just and fine. So, um, uh, when, I, when I'm unfettered and right, um, uh, I can speak in one way, when I need to deliver to the higher education sector and the treasury, um, then uh, I'm in a very different language. Um, and, um, uh, a, a report which is authored by a committee doesn't necessarily reflect the university of the city of November. Did you have major disagreements with the committee? I think we, that's, that's, a, that's a good and important question. Um, and we were would, we would agreed on the substance of the recommendations that we were making. Um, you spoke about autonomy and accountability. I think a lot of people in this room, um, especially the academics in the room, and the students will realise this as well, for example, through the NSS, the various forms of accountability to which they are subject, feel that the accountability regime, and I think you suggest that you agree with this, that the accountability regime has gone out of hand. But one might argue that the reason it's gone out of hand is because it's the other side of the fees regime. That the government felt in implementing the fees regime, which, which in some sense followed from the Brown Review, it's obviously different in some important but in many respects, the government justified that by introducing ever more regulation of every aspect of what we do in universities. So we end up with the worst of two systems. In the States, for example, my, my colleague from the States, who, uh, whom I was speaking to the other day, there's very little government regulation of the day-to-day -day workings of the university, far more autonomy over what they do in terms of curriculum design. Um, for many of us, our experience is that there is far too much bureaucracy, far too much so-called accountability, 
and that a lot of that in fact has to do with the mistakes that were made in that period after the financial crisis. And I wonder, and in light of the proposed TEP, in light of the route that we seem to be following, I wonder what your view now is um, of those regimes of accountability. I, I think my, my view is history is more complex than that. Um, uh, and and also, you, you, um, you instance the US, I mean, it, it, the US has massive variations between, also, between private and state universities. And one of the things which is striking in the US now it is the number of great state universities which are across. Um, uh, there are state universities um, which, which don't have budgets in the state. The state universities uh, were a higher freeze as they mandated by, by state governors. Um, that is, there was massive uh, intrusion, particularly involving governments into uh, the operation of state universities in the US. Um, and you know, for those who have been following this, I mean, you know, great university like Berkeley um, you know, is, is going through compulsive change um, because of the budgetary and regulatory constraints which are, which are on it. So I, I think you know, the, the American example is, is, is a more complex example, or at least a more diverse uh, example. I mean, the, the, the reason I would, I would, I would resist. Um, the simple proposition that, that what we did after 2008, what we did around Brown, um, triggered uh, a series of regulation intrusions, because most of those um, uh, have much deeper origins. So if you think about the assessments of research, and that goes back to the 1980s. Um, if you think about if you think about TAP and what's been proposed, um, it's nothing like as intrusive or bureaucratic as it's if you quality assessment. Uh, of the of the 1990s, which which preceded the first few, we don't know yet. Look, that's a that's a that's totally bad one. Um, and the silver was a trying to persuade government that, that, that it would be an error to, to replicate mistakes in the 1990s. But but my, my point is um, uh, that um, that there has been um, a, a, a much longer history of, of that kind of regulation. Um, uh, I think there are two other things that I want to say about it. One is that um, the kinds of regulations that have been made upon universities are not out of line uh, with the regulatory reflex that other uh, recipients of public funding have received. So it, it tells you much more actually about the way the state operates in the way in which universities in particular relate uh, to the state. Um, the second thing that I would say, this, this is provocative. Um, is that the cue for quite a lot of government intervention is what people in universities say is wrong with universities. So it's played back to us, it's played back to us in a hostile way. Um, but um, you know, there, is, there is virtually nothing that government does which has not been trailed in the pages of the Times Square. So I, I, we, should reflect, we should reflect on that actually. Um, uh, um, 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 uh, teaching hours, uh, teaching uh, quality, the um, more or less weekly reviews of the uh, research uh, excellence uh, framework, um, uh, government intrusion into uh, admissions policy, um, degree inflation, uh, do you want to go on? So, how, can you give me a, sorry, I'll give an example where somebody in the time side has said something which the government has oh, and, and I'm, not, I'm not suggesting it's a one to one relationship. No, what, no, I, what, no. I am, what, I, what, what I am doing is saying that, and, it, and it's, I mean, a part of this is healthy, yeah? so um, a part of this is, is, is a consequence of the way in which universities live debate, the way in which um, we have systems of, as it were, internal accountability. Um, uh, but nevertheless, um, that is used by, by government frequently um, as, as an unscientific resource for what is wrong with universities. Um, uh, and most, most government interventions um, are, are not strong evidence. Um, uh, and, and so I, you know, I think we, we, I said it was a good point, but I think, I think we just need to, um, we need to recognise that some of the things that we say about ourselves are picked up by others uh, and used in ways that were probably not originally intended.
I think they're both distinct. Yeah, they're, they're, two, they're two are distinct, and I'll come back to that. But let me just say something about, about, about private providers, uh, pure and simple. Um, I think, as you said, they, they enter the market, they enter the market with imperative to make profit, in yeah. which um, uh, traditional uh, universities, not for profit, or not for profit universities, do not have. Um, uh, so if, if we allow the private providers to compete on quality, then something that we are failing to do. That's, I think, quite important discipline, and it's quite an important challenge uh, to us. And we have an established reputation. Um, we don't have the need to, um, uh, to meet shareholder uh, expectations. Um, and, and therefore, I think we have particular advantages um, which, which ought to enable us to um, be the predominant providers of our education. Um, as, as far as um, the joint ventures are uh, concerned, um, uh, you know, I think one should have a sympathy about the optics of that. Um, uh, quite a lot of that is in the area of, of, of international recruitment and pathway provision. Um, that pathway provision, where it's not delivered by the joint venture, it's delivered by a private provider, where the standards are lower and the way that the person is. And if you think about, for example, international student recruitment, uh, most of that is contracted out of agents, um, uh, over which the institution has very little control. Um, uh, and for those reasons, actually, uh, you, you, you create a joint venture which gives um, universities absolute academic uh, uh, control and uh, a, a revenue share, um, uh, and um, the, the ability um, to, uh, to influence its routes to market without actually having those other So, so the, the alternative is not quite the alternative. But of course, universities could do that. I mean, the University of Essex, for example, for a long time, for going on 20 years, has recruited students to a, a pre, a first year, before they go into their first year. They've done it um, without going through private providers. They had a very, very successful program, which I think is only recently um, they're talking about selling off. Um, so there are there are other routes. My point is, the moment you allow providers in in that manner. Don't you then begin to change the ways in which universities operate, how they perceive what they do? This is not already a, a betrayal in some sense of, the, of an older style of education, an older model of education. Um, not if the university retains its, its academic control uh, over, over the program, not if the university retains, retains its, its control over. Can, can it always do so if the, if the private provider, for example, has to justify to shareholders, the eventual shareholders of most of uh, profits? If, so if, for example, it becomes too costly, uh, the, there is always a danger that venture closes down. Um, in universities, there are always ways around that. There are ways to work within the institution to do it. There's, there's, in other words, other pressures are brought to bear. Which are not necessarily the pressures that universities are used to. Absolutely uh, not in the same way. I, I, I accept that some of these are pressures that universities are not used to. Um, but I mean, what, what, what you're talking about is, 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 is fundamentally the recruitment of international students. Yes. But, um, although it, has, it is moving into other areas as well. Well, but fundamentally, the, the, the examples you exist are about the recruitment of international students in a highly competitive market uh, with, with a very substantial amount of private. Uh, in, in other jurisdictions, um, and um, uh, uh, universities, universities, systems, and the Australian system, which moved into this much, much earlier than we did, and, and we were losing out to them. Um, uh, and if you look at, well, just look at the track data for, for universities, um, and if you look at the activity in universities which is, which is underpinning research, which is um, almost always lost money. Um, and and um, uh, a significant number uh, of the undergraduate disciplines um, which require a cost subsidy to be sustainable. Um, imagine a university um, that lost its international students. And go for it. Um, two, one last big question and one very small question. 
Do you think there's a limit to the salaries that VC should be paid? Uh, and yeah, if I can just follow that up, you'll realise that um, many staff in the room would have experienced pay cuts of around about 10% over the last few years um, because pay hasn't kept up with inflation for reasons linked to austerity. Um, vice chancellors, on average, have enjoyed increases in their wages above inflation over the course of the same period. I think many people find that objectionable, and I wonder what your view is on that. Um, if you think it's justifiable, and if you think perhaps all VCs should take pay cuts. Um, one, there are limits to what vice chancellors um, should be paid. Um, two, it's not for me to say what that is, because contrary to popular um, uh, reportage, um, we don't set our own pay, so we don't set a um, thirdly, I think it, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, it's interesting how people assume you use the resource that you earn. Um, uh, so now, the fact that I'm a major benefactor to my own university and to several others will not be reported. There is a, a refusal because that doesn't conform to the paradigm. Um, the, the, the other thing I would say, which I think is, I, I don't want to give the, you know, the, sort of the trade union answer to this question. Um, if you look at the tenure of our chances, the tenure of our chances is going down. Um, the average tenure of our chancellors now is, is four years. Um, uh, and um, the university is firing the vice chancellors. Um, uh, and um, you know, vice chancellors are, are in a position which they don't feel they can sign up to another five years. Um, they are accusing themselves from, from the role. Now, make what you, make what, make what you would of that. Um, the final thing I would say actually about vice chancellor's salaries is um, there's a lead table that Times Higher will not publish. Odd thought that Times Higher will publish a lead table. Um, and that's the league table, which is the proportion of university turnover, which the vice chancellor earns. And it almost, you know, it almost inverts the normal story. One last question, then we should turn to the audience. Um, you've been in higher education, you've been one of the key figures in British higher education, probably for two decades now. Um, occupied a number of very important roles, you've affected the lives of many people sitting here. If there was one mistake that you've made that you deeply regret over the course of that tenure, what would it be? But you do 
delay taking action, and then more people in the institution suffer. Um, so it's, it's those and it's those sorts of decisions I think which um, I'm not going to be indelicate to do so. But I can two or three where I, you know, I, I should have acted earlier. Um, I delay. I thought I'd be humane. Okay, um, before I open up to the forum, I'm going to just ask you one question <coughs> lots, but it's to do with the shift from aristocracy to, or the aristocratic model to the democratic model. There's an argument that the indebted student is actually a lot less of a political participant because of the massive debt that they're going to uh, be loaded with, and, and that indebtedness in general is a massive threat to democracy in general, and therefore the uh, the system that has been introduced, that maybe is the fault of the government as much as the, the prior review, but the fee system is anti-democratic. We haven't moved from aristocratic system to democratic system. We may have more students in university that are <coughs> democratic because they are not autonomous anymore because they are tied to this enormous debt. And so, and, and just I do want to just mention management salary as well. Obviously, it's ironic that you know there's this democratic process supposedly and yet what we have is an elitism between the management arguably are an elite now their, their salaries are so much larger than, than staff not to mention anybody else uh, admin, admin staff cleaners etc et so that, that's almost a kind of aristocracy in the making within the university so it doesn't seem to I mean that's a slight exaggeration but it has exponentially increased uh, the, dif the difference between academics and, and, and senior management. Um, so I just wondered what you thought about that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you only need to be in position for four years because you can never retire to sell the profits, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a tremendous point of view. Um, I think that there, there, there are a number of strands to that. I think the, the point you make actually about, about the nature of our democracy is, is, is in the end a different one, which I think that's really the question is about. Um, uh, uh, and it, it, is, it seems to be critically important that, um, that young people, not just students, but young people, and the people on the first part, my kids, um, uh, engage in democratic process. Uh, and you know, and I think that, that there are within our particular culture now. I think there are real challenges. There are real challenges of engaging in a shaped society, or at least that um, is a kind of light the, you know, the speech that I make to students, and actually you know, the future is theirs, and they should shape the future. Um, and if they don't, then actually liberal democracy is, is I think, under some challenge. So, so that's the first thing I would say is. Um, I don't think it's functional students, but that is, I think it's something that is, 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 is wider and deeper uh, than that. Um, the second thing I'd say is that um, uh, I think we are in the process of moving to a very different way of funding the state and public services. Um, uh, so, um, more services that have traditionally been provided by the state will become paid for. We can have a long discussion about what that might be, but I think for a variety of reasons, uh, we have reached the limit uh, of, of what states are prepared to do by way of physical transfer. Um, uh, the third point I'd make about um, you know, creating new aristocracies within the universities, um, uh, I think behaviours are what matter most. Um, and uh, I think, in, in terms of, we we, we we go back to salary differentials if, if you want, but um, but the critically important thing, if you're in a senior position, in, 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 is, is how you relate to the things which uh, you are you, you are part. Um, uh, and, and it doesn't seem to me, I, I, mean, I would not characterise my mode of behaviour as aristocratic, even if my mode of behaviour. Yeah. Could we argue that men don't act uh, democratically all the time? Um, Floor, Claire's first, sorry. Uh, just put your hand up and I'll, I'll get a list. Thank you. 
and work in which accountability is not accountability of one which is what we've already talked about, and how it would be nice for one world to be accountable to society that funds us. Um, but it's accountability in terms of value for money, um, which actually is going to be taken into consideration. And so I was very confused when we finished speaking, and it made me a bit by bit. Um, I've also managed to kind of understand more the part that you see as I'm playing with it, so listening to your funds to Mark, which I'm grateful for. Um, but I wondered if um, this part of this confusion actually comes about through this reading that you have of moving from an aristocratic to a democratic model. So I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not going to imitate what Anthony just asked. I have a different way of viewing this actually. Because I think if we go back to Aristotle, there's another way in which we can think of this relationship. Because Aristotle talks about the city of such models, and these talks about oligarchy. And that was absent in your um, reading of where we are today. Um, and I wonder when we think about the role of knowledge, if actually we need to think about the role of knowledge moving away from the aristocracy where knowledge is to serve the purposes of virtue, um, towards this idea that we have that we're moving towards the democratic view of knowledge in universities, um, which to me would be a more egalitarian way to think about knowledge, one where everyone has access to knowledge. Um, and a lot of people will back up this fee system now saying actually it enables more people to have access to knowledge. Um, however, I wonder if actually in a democratic system, Knowledge is not about those who can afford it, that would be more an oligarchic system. And it doesn't matter whether you can afford it before you get your education or whether you can hope you can afford it one day when you've got this lovely job that you're promising or more graduate. Um, I wonder if actually in a democratic system, knowledge is something that actually should be available to all, regardless of where you come from and also regardless of where you end up. And that then got me to thinking about this distinction between aristocracy and um, democracy and oligarchy and knowledge. And I was wondering, because you kept telling me that there were cutting all of us, that knowledge from universities is to serve society. Um, and so society should pay. And I'm not sure anyone would ever quibble with that idea, because it certainly matters to serve society, but all benefit. And that means it's not just graduates being benefited, it's society who's benefited. Um, I wonder if actually, at the moment, what we're saying is knowledge is not serving society, knowledge is serving skills for the labour market. What we're doing in the is not producing knowledge, but producing skills. Um, to produce employers for the labour market. Therefore, this is not about the um, society, it's about skills serving the labour market. That, therefore, to me, is a much more oligarchic model and not a democratic model. The democratic model, I completely agree with you, is about the labour serving society. Therefore, if society is really ready to catch up and society is meant to be, and you should start collectivising, I don't see that the system is going to be because it's individual. I think it's a very, very different. I think individualisation of fees is actually where the individual student, regardless of where they come from now, but where they're going, has to pay for their own education. And society, whoever has the money in society doesn't have the money in society, is no longer paying for that. So we're not collecting with, um, knowledge. What we're doing is we're actually individualising it. This then ties when I ask people to talk about and Christ Chancellors and what they do with their money. Um, it may be that you are very unanimous with your Christ Chancellor's salary and you will donate it, but there's actually no requirement and that is then an individual choice. I, I love to have the transfer of a lot of my family to universities, to knowledge, to society in general. I like to start with the NHS as well. I went to universities at the moment. Um, I don't have that choice. I therefore don't have that freedom. Um, I wondered if actually this is where the incentives <coughs> sort of ending on your, 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 your talk, and that's where I got a little bit confused. I think actually what you have done is made quite a move from an aristocratic system to an oligarchic <coughs> And I wonder if that might also be something that you regret now when you look back at what you were doing in the Um, yes. <laughs> Um, 
Um, so it, it, it seems to me that if, if you choose to if you choose to take on certain responsibility at certain points, um, you 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 have a limited range of choices. Um, uh, you, you can take yourself off the stage, uh, and, and you can become a commentator, and you can become a critic, uh, or, or you, you, you you can remain a participant. Um, and and I I've, I've, I've chosen that to remain a, a participant. Um, I've chosen to remain a, a discrete participant. Um, so there are things that um, that would have happened that haven't happened about which I don't speak. And because my ability to remain an influential participant is to some extent a dependent on, on, on that discretion. Um, and uh, I, I think in in Brown, what we were trying to do is to balance two things. Now you think you, you may think those two things are irrevocably intentional, um, but we were trying to balance the individual and the social and do so in a way that persuaded government that it should remain the predominant funder of higher education uh, for the foreseeable future. And that's, that's, that's the accommodation that we reach. So government is the exclusive funder uh, with the research charities on one side. Government is the exclusive funder of research uh, in universities. Um, it's the exclusive funder of the additional costs of micro subjects. Um, it is um, the, the funder of widely participation and access, uh, and it remains um, uh, the exclusive funder up front of, of the cost of the more undergraduate education. Now, there were other deals on offer, potentially those I think were uh, for me less possible deals than, than, than that deal. But that was, you know, I accept, I accept the first one, but that was the one um, that uh, I thought it was appropriate and equitable to strive for. Okay, I'm going to privilege students. If there's any other students haven't yet raised their hands, please do. Uh, but and and even though Claire was brilliant, try and make it a little bit quicker, please, Dave. <laughs> Um, 
and I, I, I don't think um, uh, it, it, it's helpful, therefore, to, to characterise universities as businesses, though I think some things that we do should be business like. Um, and when, when students pay fees, um, it doesn't seem to me appreciate that that their status as a student. What does it mean to be a student uh, in a university? It means it, it means you're part of that that academic community. Um, it means that you are committed to learning within that community. It means that you are committed to generating knowledge and understanding within that uh, community. Um, and uh, you are a part of uh, the the values which, which animate that university. Community. Now, all of those seem to me to be very different um, from you know, me going into the store and buying a plant. Um, so uh, that's that's why I, I think, notwithstanding the way in which universities um, are funded, um, uh, and you know, as I said earlier on, the, uh, the 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 trend in university funding is a trend that goes back to the 1970s. Um, and it, it is a consequence um, of a decision to expand higher education, um, but not a blank check. Um, and if I mean, there will be people who remember this, um, the worst period for the universities was the 1990s, when the, when the resource we had available to educate students effectively was half. Um, and um, the decision of the Deering Review uh, to move towards some element of contribution um, was um, a decision to reverse that trend, um, which we do see in a number of your, you, you talk about your, in a number of your kids, uh, we, there, there, was, there was more investment per student um, in the English system of higher education than anywhere else in Europe. Um, and that's been a dividend uh, from uh, the, the rebalancing of university funding that's taken place over the last 20 years. Okay, Kate. Change your mind. Okay, Tom. Okay. Um, yeah, just very quickly and very simply, we highlighted the importance of the universities of knowledge. Uh, we highlighted the host of problems with the university that mostly traditionally sat in the political realm. But when answering the questions, you've always answered with an economic answer. I was purely wondering why. Why is the solution to be found in economics for traditional political problems? Yes. Um. I don't think I always have been a, a negative cancer. Um, uh, I think in a, in, in a system like ours, um, uh, where universities are predominantly publicly funded, um, those of us who have responsibility for the leadership in universities in the sector have to win an argument for funding. And we have to win an argument which is a competitive argument against the priorities of public funding. Um, and uh, so, I, I, so I don't, I don't apologise for doing that. Um, uh, so for 15 years, um, the longer than 15 years, part of my life has been about winning the argument for public investment in higher education as against other things. Um, but that's a means to an end, not an end in itself. So um, the language uh, I would use when talking about you know, what it is we should prioritise as a university, what it is we should do as a university. Uh, that, that's a language about academic priorities, um, that's a, a discourse around the, the nature of, 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 um, of a university um, as, as a place of research and, and education. Um, uh, but um, th there is an argument here about means and ends. Okay. Go on. Very, very, very quickly. Uh, that just sounds like it completely jars with what you've said in that line. You, you've been outlining how the university has to be autonomous and working for knowledge, but then you've just been highlighting how for 15 years you've been struggling to secure investment and funding. Surely that shows there's a rework in the university to get market funding, which is taking it away from your primary goal of the university. Just think about what happened. I mean, the, the universities have always um, had to argue for funding. Um, it, 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 it's, it's a kind of existential issue. Um, so it, it, it's, it's who funds and, and, and how. Um, uh, so you know, there, there were arguments with, you know, with bishops and archbishops and cardinals and popes. Um, they were uh, arguments with aristocrats. aristocrats. Um, if you look at the history of the German system, the German system was the first to be a heavily government-funded 
system. Um, so, uh, in, in that, you know, one of the things that is insufficiently appreciated about the way in which English universities are funded is um, almost all of the funding that comes into universities, with the exception um, of international students, comes from government still, actually. Um, and um, I think you know, it's only it's only if you've been there, it's only if you've been in those councils that you realise how fragile that is. So, Dan, can, I, can, I, can I just pick up on that? Because, it, yes, it does come from government, but that's because government can write off much of that funding to future fees that students will pay back. So the way in which that's structured in terms of government finances means that debt gets written off the books. It's not strictly speaking, speaking government financing and higher education. Well, the cash changes hands. The cash does change hands, but it's, but it's done now through a wholly different system to the one that was, for example, instituted after 1964 with the Education Act. Uh, um, no, no, the, the public accounts are done on a different basis. Uh, the funding is, it's one of the goes to the market to borrow money. I mean, the, the cash change changes hands. But, in, but the reason the government can do that is because they say to students that they will pay, 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 pay 55% of it on the current amount of charge. So government, government will pay 45% of that. Okay. Um, the graph. Yeah, I just a question about accounting. You said research needs to be accountable. Uh, it's hard to think of anything that's more accountable than research. Experience. If your research is crap, peer review will say don't publish it. If nonetheless it is published as crap, people will pile in and tell you it's crap. Why do you need to say or have extra accountability systems for research? I really don't get that. Uh, no, my. I wouldn't be quite presenting as that, but um, no, I, I, no, I, I, no, I take that. I mean, I take that point. Um, my, my, my point actually was, was, was really a public engagement about a responsibility to communicate um, in, in, in languages other than the language which is peer reviewed to a wider public. Um, and I think for a long time um, uh, you know, the, the academic community um, has, has regarded it um, as in part vulnerable to communicate in certain kinds of ways. So that's my that's my basic public engagement point. The public has a right to know, it has a right to be able to understand um, the research um, which is conducted in universities. That's my point. Okay. Okay. Well, and not ultimately, it, 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 two things. One is if that doesn't happen, um, uh, our, our public culture is impoverished, and also if it doesn't happen, uh, the public is, is less likely to find out. Um, because we started late and because we've got a lot of people who want to ask questions, we're going to run over a bit if that's okay with everyone. Is that okay with, with you? Just five more minutes. Probably need an extra drink as a result. Yeah, you can get an extra drink, don't worry. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, just, I was going to say, I think I might be right in saying that there's a lot of people who are angry, there's a lot of students at Russell Central that, that feel angry about the, the rise of tuition fees. Um, because number one, we're told, um, you know, what someone said earlier that you know this is an investment, which you see as an investment for our future, and that you know going to university will increase the chances of getting employment. Um, we're getting very like a lot better pay when we're employed as well. Um, but we see increasing numbers of graduates who are unable to find work, and who you know people that are working at like McDonald's or call centres on that zero hour um, contracts on minimum wage as well. And so it seems. It just seems a bit ironic that we're told this, especially from people who are in quite well financial positions, that you know, you come to university, get all this fee, but then we're able to find a job afterwards. And also, the fact that we're told this by you yourself, also members of parliament, who actually attended university for free, and we're told that you know, we need to pay this £9,000 a year, etc., etc., by people who are actually earning in comfortable positions themselves. So my question is, uh, can you understand why the students um, across the country and possibly in this room would be angry um, at the fees that are put in place and at the people who have put them in place, at the, the sheer like unfairness of it? And if you can understand it, then what do you think that can be done to resolve it? 
one of the interesting debates is that the debate about whether you can pay that front of higher education or not, or whether actually you have to lock yourself into a system of loans so you make a, a contribution and a repayment. So, is it going to be a discount for our front payment, like some institutions do? Uh, no, it's actually it's interesting, it's not a big issue. Um, okay, um, behind that. Two more questions, Bob. Reduction is a symptom 
of the disparity of the increased salary. And what's already been mentioned is the sort of de facto conversion of the role inside the VC to CEO. So like football managers uh, who are, you know, become symbols of success or failure. Um, this, this, this is what seems to be happening in the university role of VC. And you have this rather insulting idea that you know the university said we have to pay what it takes to secure the talent. Um, finally, the notion that, and again you mentioned this, that it is behaviour that counts, um, and picking up on Claire's point, I suggest it's precisely what the aristocrat would say, um, noblesse oblige. So I'd like to give you another opportunity, and it won't go any further than this room, <laughs> and, and I'll abide that point, uh, to see that the growing disparities in salaries between VCs and staff is indefensible. Um, I'd like to forego the, the drink, but I'm not going to see it's indefensible, it's not indefensible. Um, then um, it, I, I wouldn't behave as I do. Um, what, and, and the point I made actually about, about, about tenure was actually you know, just a point about um, the scale and scale of pressure of the job. Um, we're, not, we're not going to agree about this. Um, I, for my part, I have never negotiated a salary in my life. Um, so I spent a lot of time with people, with many people in my own institution who negotiate their salaries. Um, uh, I think we've, the, one, of the, one of the mistakes, and it, it may be mistakes I've actually replicated elsewhere by government, is, 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 is once you, you, you put various things in the public domain, you create details, once you create details, you create test of questions and so forth. Um, uh, but but you know, for me, the, the issue of, um, of, of uh, speaking for myself, the issue of my salary. It is not an issue which I think distracts me from doing the job in, in a way which the university community more generally values. Um, uh, and um, it, you know, I don't think um, the, the colleagues I know most closely are, are in the business of, of, of optimising their own. I think they do the, the, the job for, for very different reasons. Okay. But I would say, I'll, I'll, I'll forget before, before, before we say thank you, I've got a very important announcement that I am. Um, one of the students has. Please listen up. Hi, sorry, I promise I won't take too much of your time. I know everyone's desperate for a plan. Um, I'm just here to very briefly tell you the story of a young man called Lukman uh, Onikosi. Now, Lukman Onikosi is currently a research associate at Sussex University, also used to be a student there. Um, he is a committed academic, he is a committed activist, and he's a great friend to a great very many people in the city. Uh, Lukman has come to us from Nigeria, and for some reason Theresa May and the Home Office have seen fit to decide to deport Lukman. Uh, Lukman currently suffers with uh, hepatitis B, which is a serious condition in his liver. Uh, two of his brothers, who, still, who are still living in Nigeria, have died from this condition. Uh, Lukman receives life-saving care here. But despite that, the Home Office have decided to essentially condemn him to a certain death. Now, Lukman is not the only victim of this. You know, it will be ridiculous to say he is. You know, it's part of a wider campaign of state violence on campus, you know, including things to prevent. So what a group of activists in Brighton decided to do is we are planning a fundraising concert at the Cowley Club uh, this Friday at 7 p.m. to help uh, fund his legal uh, costs. Uh, there's also there's leaflets here that we'll be handing out. Uh, there is also a link at the bottom to a fundraising page in an attempt to you know, fight this, what is essentially a heinous decision that is essentially condemning, you know, a young man to death because I don't really know why. I guess he was born in the wrong place and have the good sense to be born here. So yeah, there's paper, there's leaflets here. Have a look. Um, we'd really appreciate if you come along. You know, this is a very worthy cause, even though it's very easy to feel quite powerless about these kinds of things because it's so widespread. 
but this is a real opportunity to make a difference in someone's life. So, thank you for your time. So, we'll be going to the wagon and horses. Um, if you'd like to join us, uh, can we thank David Eastwood and Mark for, for a great session?